Alright, this lesson is 5.3.2, solved by factoring. We're still in section 3 of chapter 5, so we're still practicing how to solve equations that involve tri trig functions. But these problems are going to require that you do some sort of factoring. And so it's really important that you remember your factoring skills from Algebra 1 and Algebra 2. Uh, in example 3, we have uh, two different equations. Each of them are going to show us two different types of factoring methods. Uh, and just to make sure you note that we're only finding solutions from 0 to 2 pi for these because both equations involve sine, cosine, or just plain cosine. Okay, so let's start with letter A over here. When we look at this equation, you might be tempted to say that there are three separate terms because cosine, sine, and then a 3 cosine over here. But in reality, there are actually two full terms. This cosine x sine x is one full term and so we can't separate the cosine and the sine x very easily. Um, some of you may be tempted to divide the cosine over to the other side, and that's generally a bad idea. We don't want to divide so that we completely lose the trig function. When we do that, we're actually losing possible solutions. Instead, when you see two um, trig functions like this with varying types of terms, you want to set one side equal to zero and try to factor. So my first step is to try to set one side of the equation to equal zero. And personally to me, it just seems easier to move three cosine x um, over to the other side. So that's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna subtract three cosine x from both sides. And so I have cosine x sine x minus three cosine x. And so we see that these are actually two very different terms. We can't combine them. This is a cosine x sine x. That's the type of term it is. This is just cosine x. So I can't combine these two terms, but now that they're on one side of the equation and it's set equal to zero, now hopefully there's something I can factor out of each term. So at this stage, we're gonna try to factor. So if you look at the two terms, their common factor is the cosine x. Cosine x right here matches the cosine x right here. And so we can divide both of these terms by cosine x and bring that out to the front. So the cosine x comes out to the front and left inside the parentheses is what's left after I divide each of these terms by cosine x. So cosine x sine x divided by cosine x leaves me with just the sine x. So that's what gets brought down here into the parentheses. And then when I divide negative 3 cosine x by cosine x, all that's left is the negative 3. And so I have sine of x minus 3 left in the parentheses. And that's what's equal to 0. Okay. Our next step is called using the zero product property. This property was introduced in uh, Algebra 1 and 2, and it's a very simple property. It says when you have two objects being multiplied together, usually we say a times b, and they're set equal to zero, that means either a is equal to zero or b is equal to zero, because we know zero times anything is zero. So right here, I do have two things being multiplied. The first object is the cosine of x. The second is this whole expression, sine of x minus 3. And so we have to split this using the zero product property into two separate equations now. So my first equation is just, I'm going to say cosine of x could equal 0. And in my other situation, I could say sine of x minus 3 equals 0. One of these two things must be true. Either cosine of x is 0 or sine of x minus 3 is equal to 0. And so we took um, a rather complex equation and we made it into two simple ones. Notice that each one only has one type of trig function in it, and so it becomes very easy to solve for. In my first equation, I'm going to try to find the inverse cosine of zero. In other words, I'm trying to find what angles for cosine give me a ratio of zero. Okay, if you look on your unit circle, we know that the cosine of pi over 2 And since we're going all the way from 0 to 2 pi, 3 pi over 2 are solutions. That would give us a ratio of 0 for cosine. So those are two of my solutions for x. I may have more. I need to check with my other equation over here. This equation has an additional step in it. I need to solve for sine x because we have this minus 3. So I'm going to add 3 to both sides. So I just get sine of x is equal to the ratio 3 to 1. 
if you think about your unit circle, is there a time when sine of x would reach a ratio as high as 3 to 1? The answer is no. The largest value in your range of values for sine of x are from negative 1 to 1. Okay, And because of this range of values, sine of x will never equal 3. Okay, So there's no solution for this part. And our only two solutions are pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. Okay. So this is one form of factoring where we set um, one side of the equation equal to 0, factor out our greatest common factor, and then set each of the factored um, expressions equal to 0 using the zero product property. In example b over here, we're going to do a different procedure. Okay. Since the um, only type of trig function we have in B is cosine of x, and we're already set equal to zero. We pretty much need to see if we can factor at this point. Now, some of you may be confused because we have a cosine to the fourth plus a cosine squared minus two. How do we factor that? Well, there's a couple different ways you can think of it. Sometimes I tell my students it's easier if you just imagine that cosine of x is a regular variable, and then it might seem like something more familiar to you. So for me, um, I'm going to go ahead and change cosine of x to just plain old x because that's what most of my students are comfortable with. So this could kind of be represented as x to the fourth plus x squared minus 2 equals 0. And now we can see this is a very easy quadratic that we can factor. If you forget how to factor quadratics, um, the, the trick is you look at factors of your constant, which is the negative 2, that would add up to your b term. Remember we said that when we have quadratics, our quadratic is ax squared plus bx plus c. And so we called the negative 2 our c term. This 1x squared here, 1 would be our b term, and the 1x to the fourth would be our, one, um, our, our a term. So I'm going to look for factors of c that add up to b, factors of negative 2 that add up to 1. That would be positive 2 and negative 1. Okay, And so once we find 2 and negative 1 to be our two factors, we're ready to go ahead and factor this into two binomials. I know that one binomial has to have a plus 2 in it, and the other binomial has to have a minus 1. Now, because this was x to the fourth power and x squared, our first term should be x squared and x squared. And you can see pretty easily that x squared times x squared is x to the fourth, so that's my first term x squared times negative 1 minus x squared plus 2x squared, that gives me my positive 1x squared, and then 2 times negative 1 is negative 2. Okay. Um, this hopefully looks very familiar to you as well, x squared minus 1. That's called the difference of squares because the first term is a perfect square and the second term is a perfect square, and because they're being subtracted, we can actually factor this into x plus 1 times x minus 1. Uh, this is a sum, uh, and so we can't factor this. There are no factors of 2 that would add up to 0, since there's no b term. So I just have to leave this as x squared plus 2. Okay. Now that we've completely factored it, we should probably change these x's back into what they really are, which is cosine x. So now I'm going to replace all of my x's with cosine x. So this is cosine squared x plus 2 times cosine of x plus 1 times cosine of x minus 1 equals 0. Okay. And so now we have another zero product property just like we did before but this time we have three terms to it. So I'm going to have three equations. I need to find when x uh, cosine squared x plus 2 equals 0. when cosine of x plus 1 equals 0, or when cosine of x minus 1 is equal to 0. And we can just solve these individually. If I subtract the 2 over, I get cosine squared x has to equal negative 2. And that creates a problem. Anytime you square anything, it's never going to be negative. And we can even see that if we try to square root both sides. We're going to get a non-real solution. We're going to get an imaginary solution. And we're not interested in imaginary solutions for these problems. We're looking for all real solutions. So my first uh, factor up here, when we set that equal to 0, it has no solution. 
Let's try the next one. If I subtract 1 from both sides, I'm looking for when cosine of x is equal to negative 1. Uh, if we do the inverse cosine of negative 1, that means which angle gives us a cosine ratio of negative 1 to 1. Uh, we know that cosine is negative 1 when x is equal to pi. That's my first solution. Uh, if you don't know that, it's on your unit circle. So just look for when cosine has, uh, for when the x-coordinate is negative 1. It's at pi radians. And when we solve this one, we add the 1 over. We're looking for when cosine of x is positive 1. The inverse uh, cosine of 1, the angle that gives us a cosine ratio of 1, is 0. Okay. Now we don't need to include 2 pi in that. Remember our interval is from 0 inclusive to 2 pi non-inclusive. So we're not including 2 pi in our possible solutions, but we are including 0. So my final list of two solutions would be x could equal 0 or pi. Okay. Uh, for our guided practice, go ahead and try factoring 3a and 3b on your own. All right, if you uh, attempted the problem, hopefully you recognize this is pretty much the same as our first type of problem. We need to set one side equal to zero, so I'm going to subtract the square root of 2 cosine x over. Don't let the radical make you think there's any uh, different rules to follow. We're still, this is still just the coefficient. So this is equal to zero. And I have two sine x cosine x minus root two cosine x. We're still looking for a common factor between the two of these. And so I notice I have a cosine of x here, a cosine of x here. I'm gonna factor out cosine of x. And that's times 2 sine x minus square root of 2. And now using zero product property, I set each of the factors equal to 0. So I set cosine, I'm just going to move my work up here a bit. I set cosine of x equal to 0. And I set root, uh, 2 sine x minus root 2 equal to 0. Uh, if we do the inverse cosine of 0, to find out what angles uh, that's going to be at cosine of 0 at pi over 2 and 3 pi over 2. And for this one we need to add the square root of 2 over. We get 2 sine x equals the square root of 2. We divide the 2. We see that sine of x should equal square root of 2 over 2. This occurs in two places as well from 0 to 2 pi. It occurs at um, x is equal to pi over 4 and 7 pi over 4, or no, excuse me, 3 pi over 4. Okay. So my total set of solutions would be x could equal pi over 2, 3 pi over 2, pi over 4, and 3 pi over 4. And for our last example down here, uh, we're going to subtract the square root of 2 over. We need to set it equal to 0. Okay, in the interest of time, I went ahead and just wrote this out the rest of the way for us. Um, notice when you set it equal to zero that you have four terms over here and we can do something called factor by grouping. So we group together the first two terms and find out what we can factor out of those first. Notice I took a two and one cosine out of each of the terms. And so I was left with two cosine x plus one. And over here I factored out the uh, negative square root of two. Both of those could, I could factor out a negative square root of two from. And so I was left with two cosine x minus one. And generally, if you do factor by grouping correctly, and it can be factored by grouping, then these two parentheses will be the same. And that's your one term. And then what's left over is your other one. That's the two cosine x minus two right there. Okay. The rest of the solution is there. Um, 
we'll answer any questions you have tomorrow in class.